Everybody doing all right today? Good, 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 good. I want to welcome everybody that's tuning in online right now. My name is David. So glad to have you hanging out with us, especially if this is your first time. Uh, we're so glad to have you joining us. Make sure you stop by Guest Central. Those of you online, make sure you text DP Connect to 94000. Uh, but listen, we have been in this series called Carols over the last several weeks. So if you're joining us for the first time, I encourage you to go back listen to the podcast or watch them on demand on YouTube, but we've been going through some of our favorite Christmas carols, and today in week three, we are covering the one that you just heard, Away in the Manger. Didn't our worship team do a great job singing that to us today? So I don't know if you guys realize this, but uh, here's a little story, a little background on Away in the Manger. It's actually kind of shrouded in mystery and, and controversy. Back in 1887, there was an American hymn writer named James Murray who entitled the tune to Away in a Manger as Luther's Cradle Hymn. And Luther, he was referring to the Protestant Reformation leader, Martin Luther. He said that uh, Martin Luther had not only written Away in a Manger, but had sung it to his children each night before bed. And as the song spread across America and people began to sing it at home and churches and at schools, they often envisioned German mothers rocking their babies to sleep each night with the strains of a way in a manger. Ironically, not only did German mothers of this era not sing a way in the manger, they had never even heard of it until the song arrived in Europe from his country of origin, the United States, where Murray got his misinformation on Luther remains a mystery. Yeah, because of this outstanding reputation as a writer and publisher, the story stuck. Isn't that interesting? And so we really don't know the origins of it all, but uh, Martin Luther did not write the hymn. And uh, where Murray got it from still kind of remains a little bit of a mystery. But nevertheless, it's one of the most popular carols that is still sung all across the world. And very simple lines. And just like I've done the previous couple of weeks, I'm going to read a couple of the lyrics to you because they're going to help us unpack today's message. And so uh, the very first line says, Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. The little Lord Jesus. Now, when I said that phrase, what came into your mind, little Lord Jesus? Some of you guys pictured a little baby in a manger. Some of you guys pictured Ricky Bobby talking about praying to sweet baby Jesus. Nevertheless, some of our views of who Jesus is have been informed by this idea of Jesus being little. A little Jesus. And my question to us today, is Jesus little in your life or is he Lord? Because how we view Jesus informs everything we do in our lives. And I dare say that there's a lot of people that have a very small view of Jesus. A very small view of Jesus especially when it comes to the Bible Belt. You know, everyone in the South uh, have, you know, have either been born and raised in church or have at least attended church a couple times in their life. And, and all of us, to some extent, have a view of Jesus. And I would dare say that some of us have a very small view of Jesus, a little view of Jesus when we talk about him, when we think about him. And there's actually a couple of little views that I've kind of just identified today that I feel are prominent in our culture. Some of us have a little view of Jesus as only being a moral person, that he was no different than Mahatma Gandhi or some other philosopher or some other teacher, that he was very moral, he was a good teacher, he had a lot of character, and he's an example for our lives. Some people have a little view of Jesus, and they view him only as a self-help Jesus, like Jesus is my life coach who came to make me a better version of myself. Some of us have a little view of Jesus where we view him only as our BFF Jesus. Like Jesus is my bestie. Like I talk to him when things are going bad, you know. It's my BFF. Some of us have a little view of Jesus as like he's just my counselor. Like I only talk to him when I need help. Just like you talk to a therapist, you only talk to Jesus when you need help. 
Some of us have a little view of Jesus that views him through a traditional lens. Jesus is a tradition in my life. Like I've grown up in church, it's what we do. You know, in the America, you know, Christianity is a religion of the West, and, and so it's just what we do. I go to church every once in a while, maybe twice every six weeks. Or some of us, you know, I, I go to church on traditional holidays like Christmas and Easter. Those are what we call CEO Christians, Christmas and Easter only Christians. <laughs> and it's just a tradition, but doesn't really inform my life, doesn't really impact my life, that view of Jesus. Some of us have this, another little view of Jesus, and at first glance it sounds like it's a really great view, but let me unpack that. But some of us have this little view of Jesus just being like a superhero. He came, and he's like this mythical person, this legend. He died for people's sins. Cool. I get to go to heaven. Yay. And he's just like this Marvel character, and, you know, and he's this hero person. And let me, and the list could go on and on, but let me just say this. There are so many people in our culture today that have these little views of Jesus. And they're inaccurate pictures of who he is. Now, there, to some extent, there's some truths about some of those views. Yes, he was moral. Yes, he is an example for us as believers. Yes, he, he is here to help us. Yes, he is our hero. But if we just stop there and if we just camp out on this, then what happens over time is that Jesus just becomes smaller and smaller. Author Joe Thorne talks about this epidemic of having a small view of Jesus. He says, your view of Jesus tends to shrink over time. It's not that your theology itself drifts, but sometimes you so focus on the aspect of Jesus that you tend to forget the rest. The result is a shrinking Jesus in your faith. And as your shrinking Jesus becomes small Jesus, he is easily eclipsed by idols. Let me just pause there. What is he talking about? When he, he's not talking about statues like we see in third world countries where they worship false gods. He's talking about idols of the heart, lesser lovers, if you will, things that take our attention and affection away from Jesus, things that we think that the world offers us is going to make us more happier than what Jesus offers us. These are idols. And so when we have a small view of Jesus, we, we look to other things. And this is why you sometimes lack passion, he says, and earnestness for the kingdom and the glory of God. This is why the church is shrinking in North America, because small Jesus does not inspire awe, command, respect, lead to worship, nor compel us to talk of him, much less suffer for him. And small Jesus is too little to arrest the attention of the world. Let that sink in just for a minute. Again, I think in American Christianity, we become desensitized to who Jesus is. We've been brought up in church. We just kind of go through the motions. And now we have a weak, anemic Christianity in America. And God forbid that persecution breaks out. Is your view of Jesus too small? Is your view of Jesus too small? Friends, this is going to be a challenging message for many of us here today. We've talked a lot about, in the past couple of weeks, we've talked about hope. We've talked about the gospel versus religion. But today is going to be one of those messages that may challenge you. I heard someone once say that if Christianity doesn't challenge you or convict you at times, then it's not true Christianity at all. Sometimes we need to be reminded of who Jesus is because he does demand our all. See, we don't serve a little Jesus. We need to understand that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord of all. Matter of fact, 740 times the word Lord is used over and over. 740 times the word Lord is used. We see this first used in regards to Jesus during the nativity story when the angel appears and he says, today in the city of David, a savior was born for you. Who is the Messiah? The Lord. In Luke 2, 11, who is the Messiah? The Lord. In Jesus' time, the word Lord was often used as a title of respect toward earthly 
authorities. And so, for instance, Jesus was recognized as Lord in honor of, of who he was and, and out of respect. Like when the lepers came to him and, and one of the lepers said in Matthew 8, 2, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus on numerous occasions referred to himself as Lord. Like in John 13, he says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are speaking rightly since that is what I am. After Jesus rose from the dead, the title Lord as applied to him became much more than a title of honor, but it was equated to saying that Jesus is God. And so this is why we see in John 20, after Jesus rose from the dead, Thomas looks at him and he says, my Lord and my God. This is the apostle's message uh, in the book of Acts, declaring that Jesus is Lord. Listen to what Peter says. He says, therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. Jesus is worthy of respect. One day, as Philippians says, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Friends, one day, listen to me, one day, Every knee will bow, period. Doesn't matter if you're an atheist. Doesn't matter if you believe in another religion. I'm going to say it again. Doesn't matter if you believe in another religion, because there is only one way. Doesn't matter if you're a president or a governor or a rich person. Doesn't matter if you're a demon or an angel or Satan himself. One day, every knee will bow and declare that Jesus is Lord. And friends, you won't have an option that day. You're hearing me right now and you're like, well, I don't want nothing to do with Jesus. It's because your Jesus is too small. But one day, you will bow. So you might as well be willing to bow now before you're forced to bow later. Jesus is Lord. That word Lord comes from the Greek word kurios, and it means supreme in authority. It means controller, Lord. Supreme in authority, controller and Lord. Some of us have a hard time hearing Jesus being supreme in authority and being in control. I think if we're honest, all of us, to some extent, struggle with that because we all have control issues, don't we? We all do. We all struggle. And, I, and, I, and I, as I, before I keep going, I want to bring a distinction today. There's, there's some of us that are not believers that will totally buck this type of message that don't want anything to do with it because we want to take control of our own lives, then there's some of us who are believers. And, and, and listen, I believe in our security in Christ. I believe that if you have been born again to a living hope, you are sealed, you are saved, you can't lose it by God's grace. It's awesome, it's amazing. I believe in that. Yes, that is something to clap for because we are saved by grace. 100%. But here's the deal. So here's what happens in our lives, though. Once we get saved, guess what? We become, you know, we're forgiven, but God is, takes us through this process of becoming more like Jesus, of sanctification. It's a lifelong journey. And part of that process is learning to surrender more and more in our lives yes. to Jesus. We're saved. We're not working for salvation. It's just learning to, to realize that Jesus' ways are way better than my ways. Amen. And that's a, that's a process over time. It's a process. We're not perfect. But what happens, though, is that many of us, we end up living what I call a partially surrendered life. Luke 6, 46, it says, Jesus actually warned people about this. He says, why do you call me Lord and don't do the things that I say? Why do you do that? Right? 
And so there's a lot of people that are living just a partially surrendered life. And, and again, I'll be the first one to admit, there are aspects of my life that I'm still learning to surrender, okay? We're all in this process, but there's some of us, right, that are living this partially surrendered life. And so for some of us, you know what? That's like, hey, Jesus, I'll give you my Sundays, but not my Fridays and Saturdays. Jesus, I'll trust you with my salvation, but I'm going to worry about my children. Jesus, I, I trust that you're my provider, but I'm going to handle finances the way I want to do it, and I'm not going to live generously, nor am I going to give, give in tithes and offerings. Jesus, you're my Lord, but I'm not going to forgive the person who hurt me. Jesus, I'm going to go to youth group, but I'm not going to let my parents or anyone else find out what I've been doing on Snapchat. <laughs> or on TikTok, or the DMs that I'm getting. Jesus, I love you, but I also love sleeping around. And friends, there are so many of us that have such a small view of Jesus that is hindering us, and we are living this partially surrendered life, and this is why we are experiencing such sorrow and pain and hurt and shame and brokenness, and we're not walking in the victory that God's called us to because we keep having this small view of Jesus. There's some people who read from what I call the PSV translation. You've heard of New King James Version? By the way, it's not the most accurate. I know there's like King James Version only people out there. It's not. There's a lot of other great translations. But listen, I'll tell you what one trans, the worst translation out there is the PSV Version because it's the partially surrendered version. And when you have a small view of Jesus, you interpret Scripture through the partially surrendered version. So, for instance, a famous Scripture like Proverbs 3 says this, Trust in the Lord with some of your heart. Lean on your own understanding. And in some of your ways, acknowledge Him. And you can make your own path straight. <laughs> that is the partially surrendered version. Like, I, I'm going to trust the Lord with some, some of my heart. I am mean, you know what, God, I know you're like the creator of the universe, like you're the author of life, but I think I know a little bit more about this situation than you do. God, I know your ways are above my ways, but you know what, I think my way is the best way right now. God, I think I could do this on my own. I can make my own path straight. This is how many of us live our lives. And if I'm honest, myself included at times. You know, I told you guys that story last week. If you missed the story last week, you're just going to have to go back and listen to the whole message. But you guys heard some of my story where I went through this really challenging season in my life. And I remember in that season, because I, I don't know about you, maybe, maybe I'm the only person that has this problem, but sometimes I tend to, I tend to like to be in control. Anyone else? Does anyone else have that problem? You know, there are certain things in my life that are, like, I feel like, you know, and it could be a good thing, but it could be a really bad thing at times, right? And, you know, I mean, I like to hold the remote. I mean, I don't know if that's good or bad, but, I, you know, I like to be the one that's driving. My wife doesn't like it sometimes, but, right? Um, but, you know, but, but, you know, there are certain times, and, you know, where, where I realized that it could, it could be super unhealthy. And, and during that season, I remember, uh, you know, I was trying to provide for my family. I was doing everything I can. I was doing everything I knew what to do. And I thought my ways were the best way. And I remember in that moment, in that, in that season, literally I came to a point where it was like, I can't control this. And I had to really learn to submit to the lordship of Jesus in this area of trust because I was trying to do things in my own strength. I was trying to make things happen. I was, I was doing all this stuff, and it just wasn't working out. And I had to learn that, man, I had to trust in him. See, really, the idea of submitting to Jesus is really a good thing. You know, when the angel declared, I bring to you good news of great joy, you know, the Savior is born, the Lord of all, what, what that is, the lordship of Jesus is good news for us because it means that we don't have to live in control of our lives. Amen. And it's good news when we let go and we trust, and we submit. And friends, I, I want to ask you a question today, is that what areas in your life are you partially surrendered in? We're, we're, we're all guilty of this. 
And we're all in this process as, as a Christian as we're learning to, to submit more and more into the Lordship of Jesus. We're learning. But ultimately, the goal for us is to live a fully surrendered life. Amen. And I want to clarify this, though. Listen, this is not about salvation, again, because there's some of us who we love Jesus, but you would hear this and like, oh, man, i got to work. No, 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 this isn't about salvation. This is a learning more, this is learning to become more and more like Jesus because Jesus' ways are, are, are the best ways for us. And so we see this idea, though, of living a fully surrendered life all throughout Scripture. Listen to what Paul says. Paul says, For none of us lives for himself, and no one dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord. Think about that. Paul's saying, if you're living and breathing right now, you are called to live for who? The Lord, the supreme ruler, the one who's in control, the king of kings. We are called to live for him. And if we die, we die for who? The Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we belong to who? The Lord. We belong to the Lord. When you, gave, when you accepted Jesus into your life, if you're a Christian, and you received that free gift of grace, do you understand? Yes, it was free, but it cost you everything. It costs us everything. It was a free gift. We didn't earn it, but Jesus, when we, when we received him, you know what Jesus was like? All right. I'm your Lord now. I'm in control. And I want you to live for me. See, some of us just thought, oh, I just get a free pass out of hell. But scripture indicates that, hey, that when Jesus Christ died, he died so that what? We might live for him. We now belong to him. I remember when I, my wife and I, we were, you know, uh, dating, and I knew, we knew we were going to get married, and so I, I had already been saving up money, and, 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 you know, I didn't have a lot, but I was trying my best on the youth pastor's uh, budget. <laughs> didn't make a lot of money back then, and I, I remember saving it up, man, and I bought this amazing tiny little ring. It was awesome, and uh, <laughs> it, was, it was everything for me, though. It's like, man, I, it cost me something, right? And I remember when I proposed to her, she accepted it. You know what? In that moment, I just say, hey, listen, if you take this ring, you're going to have to pay me my money back. <laughs> Is that, you know? No, no, no. It was a free gift to her. She didn't do anything to earn it. But that ring signified that she is now going to be my wife and going to belong to me and vice versa. I'm going to belong to her. Amen. See, Amen. same thing with Jesus. Salvation is free, but it means ownership now. Listen, my wife belongs to me. I belong to my wife. That means that I can't go out and flirt with other women, right? Because why? I belong to my wife, nor do I want to, because my wife's incredible, okay? Just a little side note. <laughs> Got it. But think about that. Some of us live our lives, I was like, yeah, I belong to Jesus, but we're flirting with the world. Our love, we've gone after lesser lovers, things that won't satisfy us. This is why we're struggling with, you know, with sin and all, and all sorts of compromise, right? And, and Paul calls us to live this surrendered life. And it's always in view of God's mercy. Again, we don't work for salvation. No, we are saved and secure. But it's learning to yield to the lordship of Jesus in our life because his ways are the best ways. And so how do we do that? How do we learn to live more surrendered in our life? Because, guys, this is going to be a continual thing. It's a continual process. It's a continual process. And it's not based on fear, though. And here's what I want you to understand. It's not based on that. We're not trying to live for Jesus because we're fearful. 
but because we're scared. No, we're saved, we're secure, we have peace with God, but it is based on this love that God has for us. And so let me explain. Let's go back to Proverbs 3, 5, and let's look at the, a better translation instead of the PSV version. <laughs> so this is how this works. How do we become more submitted to the lordship of Jesus in our lives? Listen to this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways, know him, and he will make your path straight. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. What does that sound like? You know, Jesus said to love the Lord with all of your heart, your soul, and mind, right? Our relationship with God is a loving relationship. We don't serve God out of fear. We serve God out of love, right? And so he calls us to love him with all of our heart, to trust him with all of our heart. Don't rely on your own understanding, knowing that God's ways are the best ways, knowing that the best way to live is the Jesus way, knowing that I don't understand things sometimes, but you know what, God, you do. I can't explain things. I know you're in control. I trust you, right? You rely on your own. You don't rely on your own understanding. And what do you do? In all your ways, you know him. Another translation says, acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight. Now listen, listen. All right, don't miss this. That idea of acknowledging him or knowing him is this intimate knowledge. It's this this loving, intimate way. That word actually yada in, in, in Hebrew means to know. It means to know God, to love him. Not to just know about God, but it's this knowledge of of this loving relationship that you're in union with each other and you love him, right? And so here's what happens. The more you know Jesus, the more you begin to what? Love him. And the more you love him, the more you obey him. So if we're going to live a surrender life, if we're going to allow, if we're going to give control to Jesus into our lives, it's not based out of fear. It's based out of knowing him. It's based out of loving him. It's based out of this knowledge that, man, I've been saved by grace, that the gospel of my salvation, right? I didn't deserve anything, and he loved me enough. He sent his son to die for my sins, right? And so, therefore, we respond with obedience. This is why Paul says elsewhere to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. But before that, he says, in view of God's mercy, in view of God's mercy, that you don't deserve to be saved. You deserve hell. But God saved you by his grace. None of us did anything to deserve it. But guess what? He calls us now to live in response to him and to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing unto Jesus. See, we please him not because we're scared. We please him because we love him. We want to bring a smile to his face. You know what? My wife and I, guess what? We're not scared of each other, but we love each other so much that we, we, we want to honor each other, we, right? We want to honor this relationship, and it's the same thing. It's the same thing with Jesus. The more we know Jesus, the more we love him, and the more we love him, the more we obey and trust him in our lives. And let me tell you something, friends. The lordship of Jesus should affect every aspect of our lives. It should. Now, we're not perfect, We're going to make mistakes. We're not perfect. None of us that thank God for his grace. We are works in progress, okay? But when we understand this and we start to grow in our relationship, and that's the key, growing. There's so many Christians who they just want to hold on to their little small view of Jesus instead of growing and and, and knowing him. And, and, And listen, you were called to know Jesus. Husbands, what would happen if, like, you know, you get, you get married, and then you don't date your wife after a while. You don't talk to her after a while. Like, you're not going to really know them, right? I know that's not, no men in here. It's right? not no one online. I'm, I'm talking to another church, right? There's no men that do that, right? Let that one sink in for a second. But what happens over time if you don't, if you don't do, if you're not intentional? There's no growth. You become stagnant. And there's so many people in their walks with Christ right now that have become so stagnant because they're not growing. There's some people that didn't grow this past year. Why? Because they didn't get connected to a life group. They didn't have other believers around them helping them grow in their faith. There's some of us that haven't even picked up our Bible in quite some time. We're not growing, and so therefore our view of Jesus is so small. Friends, we're called to grow in our relationship with him. Jesus is, 
better than anything else. His love is better than life. Why wouldn't we want to spend more time with him and grow and know him more? And listen, friends, I want to challenge you in 2022 to grow in your relationship with Jesus like never before. Not, of, not out of religion, not out of duty, but because of his love for you. That he has invited you to know him as the supreme treasure of your life. And the more you know him, the more you grow, the more you obey him. And what ends up happening is that over time is that we, 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 the lordship of Jesus starts affecting our lives. Again, we're not perfect. I'm going to give you just a quick example. I know some of you guys, I don't know why I'm talking a lot about marriages, but I guess here it is. You know, this past week, I know none of you guys don't ever get into, uh, you know, arguments with your spouses. Uh, You know, every once in a while, me and my wife do, just every once in a while. And like this past week, we we had a little scat, okay? Just a little, just a little, you know? It it is what it is. It happened. So what happened, let me just just give you a little brief uh, general overview, okay? I won't get into the details. So I do the budget right? And there was a bill that was supposed to be paid a while back. We won't say when. I forgot about it. Completely forgot about it, okay? It was my, my bad. My wife had told me a couple times, I just forgot about it, forgot about it, forgot about it. I'm going on. She gets a call. The bill hadn't been gotten paid, and I did the budget rate. I planned out. It's Christmas time. I've got this all planned out. We got a budget we got to stick with. Well, my wife, she pays the bill. She does the right thing. She tells me about it. I'm like, what are you doing? You can't pay the bill right now. I've got this budget, right? There's the control aspect. I'm like, no, we can't. We got it, right? And I am all upset. I'm like, I cannot believe she did this. And she's like, I did the right thing. You're wrong. And I'm like, no, uh And you know, and I got like two, I acted like I was two years old and all this stuff, threw a hissy fit. I'm just all upset. And like, literally, I know none of you guys ever do that, okay? I know I'm not as sanctified as you guys. All right, whatever. I'm just being honest. But, but, so, but what ends up happening, though, is that here's what takes place, and, and this probably happens more times than often, but you know what? Both my wife and I, we love Jesus. We are committed to growing in Jesus. We both realize that Jesus is our satisfaction, not each other. And so, and, and so we, we realize that we're, you know, of what he's done for us. And so therefore, because we know him and love him, we want to be more submitted to him and, and he, you know, and, and we've grown our relationship with him. So guess what happened? So because of all that, after I threw my hissy fit, temper tantrum, it wasn't that bad, just a little bit. But I remember a couple hours later, it's like Jesus was like, mm-hmm. And I'm like studying for this message about the Lordship of Jesus, and I'm like going on, oh, this is going to be good. And Jesus is like, what about for you? I'm like, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> like, you talking to me? I'm like, me? She was wrong. And Jesus was like, no, no, no. And in that moment, I was like, oh, wow. And, it, and I just had that little realization of like, wow. Like, my attitude was completely wrong. And I went because I love Jesus and I want to honor him. Therefore, I want to honor my wife and I want to be humble. I went and apologized. And I'm not telling you this to, I hate having to tell you my stuff sometimes, but, I tell, but I'm telling you this because, because this is how it plays out in our lives. It's like, we're not perfect, but we want to, because we love Jesus, we want to honor him. And so therefore, because we want to honor him, that literally informs how we treat each other right. as spouses. That's right. That's right. That's right. It literally informs how we treat our children. There's been a lot of times where I've apologized to my own kids, which is never fun. There's been times, not only, not only when it comes to apology, but just even making sure that we are honoring Jesus in our home. There's been times where we've turned off the TV. And I'm not legalistic. Trust me, I hate religion. I'm not legalistic. I'm like one of those guys that will push it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but I do not like, I don't like legalism at all. But, but because I love Jesus and I want to be submitted to his lordship, there are certain things where it's like, mm, we don't need to watch this as a family. I'm involved in my children's lives. Why? Because we want Jesus to be the center of our life. I see too many families that are disconnected. Why? Because Jesus is not at the center, and the Lord Jesus is a little Jesus in your family. And this is why your kids are struggling sometimes, or this is why there's, there's problems. Why? Because we, we think too small of Jesus. 
And friends, listen, the lordship of Jesus should inform every aspect of our lives. It should have informed how we treat people of different backgrounds and ethnicities and, and perspectives and, and you know, how, what we do with our finances, what we do when no one's looking at us. What we do when no one's looking at us. What are we doing when we're all alone? Are we seeking to insert Jesus into what we're viewing online or who we're talking to or what we're saying? And I don't say this to bring shame or condemnation, but there's some of us that need this little kick in the pants today to remind us that you were bought with a price. You belong to your Lord and Savior who paid the ultimate price for you. Leonard Ravenhill once said this, are the things you're living for worth Christ dying for? Is Jesus little or is he Lord? It should affect how we treat our, how we use our time, our talents, our treasures. It should affect us, friends. Jesus gave his all. I'm, I know this is a challenging message. Listen, I, again, I'm the one that has to filter it through me. Okay, so before you guys get it, I have to preach to myself, which is <laughs> so much fun. <laughs> but I care enough, and I love you enough as your pastor to have this kind of conversation with you. I mean, I could have just gave you a nice little pat on the back. Hey, it's about to be Christmas. Woohoo, let's have fun. But it just so happens that this message lined up on this day, and it's just like, this is a great reminder. As a matter of fact, Paul actually, he challenges us. He, he, he when talking to the Corinthian church. He actually told him, he said, hey, examine yourself, yourself. Make sure you're in the faith. And the reason why he said that, it's not to scare people, because again, there's genuine believers, but you know what? There's a lot of churches just like there was back then. Even during Jesus' time, there's a lot of people who followed Jesus, who believed in Jesus, who attended church gatherings, but weren't really in love with Jesus. And this is kind of a warning. Because I don't know who's who. Only God knows that. Again, if you're saved, I believe you're bought with a prize, you're good, man. But there's some of us who have just been playing the church game, who've just been hanging on to our parents' faith. We've just been traditional when it comes to Jesus. It's just like what we do in the South. Or, you know, I'll pay my dues. I'll be a good person, all this stuff. You know, I'll do just enough because I just want to get to heaven. But really, do you really know him? Because there's this sober warning that Jesus actually says in Matthew 7. And listen, if you haven't heard anything up until now, I want you to listen. Lean in. Listen to this, friends. Matthew 7 says this. Jesus said, he said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven, only one who is obedient to me. Right? On that day, many will say to me, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons, and do many miracles in your name? Meaning, like, didn't we do all this good stuff? I was a good person. I attended church every once in a while. I even tithed. I, you know, I served. I, I did, did a couple things. Like, look what I did, Jesus. And what does he say? I will announce to them, I never knew you. I, we were never in un, union together. We, I didn't know you. You didn't know me. You never accepted my gospel, this, this free gift of salvation, and you never surrendered to that, and you never allowed me to be the Lord of your life. You just played the game. You just went through the motions. Friends, this is a sober warning. Because I, my fear is that there's so many churches today that are filled with people who think that they're going to heaven, who think that they know Jesus, but their hearts are far from God. And listen, I love you enough to warn you. And I'm not trying to bring condemnation to those who are, who are genuine believers, but friends, for those of us who don't know Jesus, don't mess around. Jesus shed his blood. He paid it all. 
Not so that you could just live the life that you want to live. Not so that you could just live your best life now. Not, not so that you could just become a better version of yourself. Not so that you could just go to church whenever you just feel like it. Not so that you could just, like, you know, play the church game and, you know, come on Sundays and then sleep around throughout the week and it's my body, it's my life. I'm just going to do whatever I want. No, you were bought with a price, friends. Have you surrendered to Jesus? Have you surrendered to Jesus? Have you surrendered to Jesus? Examine yourself today. And listen, if you are in this moment right now and you realize, man, I, I, I don't believe I have. The gospel is good news. It's good news. It's the reason why we celebrate Christmas because as God came down from heaven to earth, why? Because we were separated from him. Our sins separated from God. Listen, I, I'm, I know we're a little bit over time, but just hang with me for a second. Listen, do you understand the cost that Jesus paid for you? Because I would dare say, if you don't understand the cost, you may not be saved. If you don't understand the cost, the price that Jesus paid for you, he shed his blood. Why did he shed his blood? Because our sin was so serious. Even, even the most moral person, your white lie would send you straight to hell apart from God. That's how serious sin is. And that's why we needed a Savior. Jesus came and he lived a perfect life for you and me. And then he died in our place. He literally... Theologians call it, the, he propitiated the wrath of God. He satisfied God's wrath. His blood was shed and it was poured out on his son. So that why? It wouldn't be poured out on us so that we wouldn't stand in judgment or condemnation. That's how serious sin is. That's what it costs Jesus. That's why on the cross he said, my God, why have you forsaken me? His blood was shed for you, for you, for you, for all of us, friends. And it was shed for us, and, and the only response is for us to respond with repentance, saying, God, forgive me of my sins. I realize my sins have, have separated me from you. And they're responding by faith and saying, Jesus, your blood was enough. You shed your, you shed your blood for me. I believe that you died for my sins and you rose again. That is how you start a relationship with Jesus. That's where it all begins is with knowing what God has done for you. And from there, when you give your life to Jesus, he makes you born again. He makes you new and he begins to change you, change you, change you over time. You become more like Jesus and you learn to live more surrendered to him. Why? Because he's the best thing for us. And so friends, listen today. As we're getting ready to close, listen. Scripture says if you confess with your mouth that what? Jesus is Lord. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then what? You will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so friends, today, now's the time. Now's the moment of salvation. 